This week we begin a new message series called Be Real. And this message series reminds us of one of our core values here at St. Paul, and that is that we are to try to follow Jesus' example and be like Jesus and be authentic in the way we behave and as our faith grows. Our hope is to be authentic not only here on Sunday morning for a couple hours when we're sitting next to people we like or family members who we love, but to be faithful and authentic in our homes, in our schools, in our workplaces, and in our community so that others might come to know Jesus. All of us, every day, all day long, being authentic and faithful. You know, one of the reasons I was pleased to take part in the Lake Junaluska trip last week is I knew it would provide a space for us to get to know each other better, but it would also provide a time of formation and transformation. And part of becoming authentic in our faith includes recognizing that God wants to help us become people who live and love like Jesus. And for that to happen, we have to cooperate with God's transforming power as he changes our minds and our hearts. You know, transformation is one of those words that's just loaded with meaning. It has meanings outside the church, but it has particular meanings within the church. And today we're going to turn to Paul's letter to the church in Rome, to a text that is all about transformation. And I will be reading from um, the New International Version Romans 12, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Now, there are a bunch of loaded words and phrases in that passage, phrases that challenge us. I mean, what did Paul mean when he said we're to be a living sacrifice? Or that we're to be transformed by renewing our minds? What did he mean that we're to test and approve God's will and that each of us, each member, belongs to all the others. You know, sometimes some texts are easy to understand just by reading the plain words of the text. But at least for me, that is never the case with the Apostle Paul. It just isn't. He's hard to read sometimes, and I think Romans is a book that we have to read really slowly and we have to pray over. And I found some help in studying this text by turning to a version of the Bible, a translation called the Amplified Bible. And it gives us the words of the text, but it provides words of explanation, words of description that help us understand and clarify the meaning of the writer. So I'm going to read that text for you again, but this time from the Amplified Bible. It goes like this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, dedicating all of yourselves set apart as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your rational, logical, intelligent act of worship. And do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. For by the grace of God given to me, I say to every one of you not to think more highly of himself 
and of his importance and ability, then he ought to think. But to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has apportioned to each a degree of faith and a purpose designed for service. For just as in one physical body we have many parts, and these parts do not all have the same function or special use, so we who are many are nevertheless just one body in Christ, and individually we are parts one of another, mutually dependent on each other. Now doesn't that help? <laughs> that helps. In addition to words that explain the plain translation of the text, the Amplified Bible can, um, it adds words that are sometimes more modern that can clarify. Uh, there were things in the Amplified Bible that really helped me and now I've discovered that it's going to become one more tool that I'm going to use when I read and study the Bible. And it's important for us to use every tool available to us. And I encourage you to do the same. I know there are folks in this church who have parallel Bibles where you can read one, more than one translation. And using all of these different tools will go a long way in the process of getting a new understanding, which leads us to a renewed mind that Paul spoke about in the text. Now let's dig a little deeper into the text itself and see what Paul was trying to teach us. We know from our reading of the Old Testament that there were lots of laws and God gave lots of instructions about sacrificing animals. There were guilt offerings and sin offerings and offerings of gratitude and, and animals were sacrificed, to be sure. That's not a common practice today. It's not a Christian practice today. But in fact, in those days, many, many religions had sacrifices. But God never, ever, ever suggested that human beings should be sacrificed. And in fact, he sent prophets to condemn, to chastise, to correct the pagan religions that included human sacrifice and to condemn those people who were his chosen people, Israel, who adopted some of those practices. We have never been asked, and Paul was not suggesting, that we would offer our bodies to be killed as a sacrifice. That's not what he meant by a living sacrifice. Now, there have been terrible times in church history when human beings were murdered and persecuted for being Christians, and it's happening today as we speak in Pakistan. And we need to remember to keep those brothers and sisters in our prayers. Even worse, I think, are the times when Christians have killed other Christians for not being the right kind of Christian. And I can only imagine that that made God weep. When Paul calls upon us to be living sacrifices as an act of true and authentic worship, I don't think he, he intended to suggest that we go find an opportunity to be killed to pr prove our faithfulness. But that doesn't rule that out. It does happen, but it doesn't happen typically here in America today. And even though we're not physically in danger in America, though, we are still called to be a living sacrifice who's pleasing to God, each and every one of us. Now, in our culture, we tend to understand the word sacrifice negatively. And I don't mean that it's negative to sacrifice for someone, but we tend to think that we have to give something up or we have to lose something for someone else to gain. For example, we have parents who sacrifice to send their children to college. And we have adult children who sacrifice to make sure their aging parents are cared for. We have all kinds of times when we're called to do things for other people. But in the context of the Bible, the word sacrifice is often um, defined or translated to mean to become holy. When we become a living sacrifice, we become holy because God is holy. And I have to tell you, I didn't help plan the music for this service, but that last song we just sang about holy forever, I mean, that's what, as we proclaim Jesus is holy, we're supposed to try to be like him. Part of the sacrifice we're called to make 
is to give up the world's way of seeing things and to give up our culture's way of overconsumption and of judging other people. We're supposed to give up old ways of thinking to become more like Jesus. And this business of changing our thinking is the way that we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. That's what Paul was talking about. Let's face it, transformation is hard. Many of us are willing, at least for a little while, to do things to transform our bodies. We'll exercise to gain strength. We'll stop eating certain foods to make our cholesterol go down. We'll have surgery if we need it to cure an illness or fix an injury. And we'll rest in order to heal. The sad reality is, and I know this is true for me, <laughs> we are far more willing to do something like that to transform our bodies than to do the hard work of, of transformation that's required to transform our minds. It's much easier to say, okay, doc, put me on a diet, put me on an exercise plan, and I'll get healthier, than it is to say, okay, Holy Spirit, I'm going to cooperate with you. I'm going to love my neighbor. I'm going to serve the poor. I'm going to love all God's people and even my enemies. And Jesus, I'm going to allow you to convict me and convince me that my current understanding has been influenced by my politics, my money, my ego, and my self-interest. I'd rather go on a diet than pray that prayer any day. Even when we pray for God to change us, even when we ask Jesus, and we ask the Holy Spirit, we ask the Father to do those things I just listed and to help, help us open our minds, we're often reluctant to follow through by doing the hard work of cooperating with God so that transformation actually happens. I mean, renewing our mind means aligning our wills with God's will. And that often means, much to our discomfort, letting go of things we learned from our families, our friends, and even some of our early church experiences. Sometimes our parents teach us to discriminate against people who are different from us. Sometimes at school or at work, we're taught to exclude people so we can be part of the in crowd or the in group or the group that's in control. Sometimes the church teaches us to act like a club for super saints rather than a sanctuary for sinners. And friends, transforming our mind means we have to become wise enough and discerning enough to know when we've been sold a bill of goods. Reading scripture, sitting quietly in God's presence, praying, can open our hearts to God's still, small voice of guidance. But that guidance and wisdom come slowly. We have to work at it. And unfortunately, as much as it would be easier if it came to us in an audible voice, it doesn't often come that way, at least not for me. I know God's talking to me when my intuition is nagging me when I'm restless about something that I know isn't right and I'm convicted because I need to do something about it. I'm convinced that that's how God speaks to me. Paul's telling us that being transformed by the renewing of our minds is really the only way that we can discern God's will. In fact, he says that we can test and approve God's will. And my first reaction when I read that scripture many years ago was to say, well, who am I to approve or test God's will? Didn't Jesus say, don't test God? Well, that's not what Paul means. I think here Paul is reminding us that we have been given a free will. We have been given the capacity to choose. 
And we can choose to accept or reject God's will. But before we can do that, we have to distinguish the divine will from the thousands of things that masquerade as God's will. Paul's telling us we must be willing to change our minds and our thinking if we're to understand, accept, and believe that God's will is better for us every time than what we would choose for ourselves when we operate out of that human ego that leads us to be prideful and, and all the other things. Paul's provided us in this text with a road map that will allow us to sync our wills with God's will, kind of like we sync our phones with things. First, we must offer our whole self, body, mind, and spirit as a living sacrifice by growing in faith and learning to be more holy as God was holy. And second, we need to cooperate with the Holy Spirit's leading and guidance in the transformation of our minds so that we have new thinking that's aligned with God's thinking. So you might ask me, well, what's the point of all this living sacrificing and this transformation? And I think Paul answers that question in verse 5 of the text that I read earlier, where he exhorts us to live in community, and not just any old community, but God's community. This is what he said. So in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Paul is calling the Christian faith community to live in unity to recognize and value each member's gifts and contributions to our life together. But he wasn't saying we always have to agree on every single subject. If you like broccoli, that's okay. I'm not going to eat it. But that also includes agreeing on subjects that are more, more serious and more contentious. We can still be people united in Christ without agreeing on everything. And Jesus had a whole lot to say on that subject. In John's Gospel, chapter 17, Jesus prayed a beautiful prayer with his disciples before he went off to pray at the Garden of Gethsemane. In that prayer, he prayed that his disciples would be one, and he prayed for the disciples who right were there with him in that moment, living in his physical presence that day. But then he went on and he did something extraordinary. He included in his prayer a prayer for us today, 2,000 years later, when he, when he wrote, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. And he meant the disciples who were with him through their message. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. That's what Jesus wants for us. He longs for us to be one just as he was one with the Father and the Father was in Jesus. He also wants us to be one with God. That's what he prayed in his beautiful prayer. But there is much more that Jesus taught us in his ministry on this earth. He taught us a lot about who we are to include in our oneness with God. He told us to love our enemies he commissioned us to make disciples of all the nations. He referred to and affirmed the Hebrew scriptures when he identified the greatest commandment by saying we are to love God and love our neighbors as ourselves. He was calling us to, be, to do so much more than liking the person in the pew next to us. He was calling on us to have a really big big tent. Right after he gave the 
greatest commandment, Jesus told the parable. Many of you know it's the parable of the Good Samaritan. And in that parable, he reminded us that the people we despise, disregard, disrespect, and disenfranchise are our neighbors. You might remember in that parable, there was a man. He was traveling on a, a lonely, deserted road. He was beaten and robbed by some bad guys and left to die by the side of the road. And two religious leaders, kind of like pastors and the chair of the church council, walked by and ignored the man and didn't help him. And then the unthinkable happened. A man that the religious insiders would have hated and despised, stopped to help the injured man. He bandaged his wounds. He took care of him. He took him to a hotel and paid the hotel bill in full and promised to pay more if it was necessary. Now, according to Jesus, that was the real neighbor. That's the person we're supposed to love. That guy who is the hated enemy, who's different from us. Jesus never said, only love the person who is like you and agrees with you on most things as much as you love yourself. Loving someone as ourselves suggests that we see them and embrace them as part of God's family. If we read the greatest commandment, the Good Samaritan story, and Jesus' beautiful John 17 prayer about us being one with each other and one in God, we can finally understand where Paul was taking us when he said, So in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Each member belongs to all the others. What would life be like if we lived that way? I truly believe Jesus and then Paul were teaching you and me as people who form a church like St. Paul that we are to love all people everywhere and include even those we'd prefer to exclude in God's big kingdom. A kingdom where God, you, me, and every person lives as one. This is the point of becoming a living and holy sacrifice. This is the result of being transformed by the renewing of our minds. This is what it means to become spiritually mature. This is how we test, understand, and accept God's will as our own will. This is what is possible if each and every one of us makes the decision to cooperate with God in the hard work of personal transformation so that we are authentic Christians every single day. If we do this, our lives, our families, our church, our community, our state, our nation, and the world can be transformed. And then, and only then, will the kingdom of God come in the fullness that God intended. And only then will we be able to say, God's will has finally been done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.